Praise the Lord, everyone. How many of you got hands out here? I only heard a few. Put them together. Give him glory. What did you just get through reading from Psalm 34? I will bless the Lord what? At all times. His praise. His praise shall be what? Continually. Continually. Praise the Lord. Glory. Hallelujah. Time to make a noise. I hope you folks are not getting tired of the judgments. Because you got to begin today. But I don't know if I'm going to get through it all. But I pray that I will. If not, then the next time. Because there are three trumpets that I did not cover, which are at the end. So. We will see where the Lord takes me on this deal. Amen. Father, I just ask today that you speak to our hearts things that we need to hear, Lord. Open our spiritual understanding to your word, to what the Holy Spirit is trying to show us. <clears throat> I know that I'm not the most eloquent vessel that you have because there are many far better than I am. But, Lord, you use all of us for your glory, Amen. no matter how big or how small or how little we may think of ourselves or someone else. But I ask today, Lord, that you would touch every heart that's here and those that are listening to us by the Internet, that you would touch hearts out there and open their eyes and their hearts ears to hear and to understand Lord that there is a better way of life Amen. and it's all in you because of what you did at Calvary thank you Lord you shed your life blood for us you died Bless for you. all our sins to cleanse us to purify us to sanctify us to separate us from the world and you came to give us life and to give it more abundantly in this life as well as the one to come. We thank you for your word. We thank you for understanding, Lord, when we don't understand things, you help us to understand better because of your revealing spirit that reveals the truth unto us as we need it. We give you praise and glory for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Judgment. Phase seven. There is a great emphasis in the New Testament placed on the wrath of God as a future judgment. John the Baptist began his ministry by announcing the wrath of God that is to come from which men should flee. Jesus likewise pronounced a wrath that is to come upon Israel and produce great distress. Paul speaks of a day of wrath to come that awaits some, but from which believers are to be delivered. The idea of future uh, wrath of God is unfolded on a large scale in Revelation. Mm -hmm. It is described in very graphic terms as cataclysmic upheavals in the universe. The wine press of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty, and the cup of his anger. I will make this statement man has not seen nothing yet Amen. but he is going to see what's coming revelation chapter 6 verse 12 through 17 john wrote he says and i beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and, and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondsman and every free man hid themselves in the 
dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from that faith from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come who shall be able to stand Mercy. in the new testament the wrath of god is not only a future judgment it is a present reality it is uh, a present reality when you stop and think about what does the bible say that god's wrath is upon the what the children of disobedience right so as we live today tomorrow and the next month in the next year if we are disobedient the wrath of god comes upon us he will correct us when we mess up he doesn't do it to just to make us feel better he does it to get our attention and let you know he's still in charge ouch lord that hurt i don't need a whipping Oh, yeah. Yes, you do. <laughs> Let me say this. You see, when we look at the wrath of God and its present reality and future judgment, it does not merely awake people at the future judgment. Jesus stated that the wrath of God abides on the unbelievers, and consequently they stand presently condemned already. In John 3 18 he says he that believeth on him is not condemned but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God in John 3 36 he says he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abideth on him now Paul says God's wrath is revealed against all an ungodliness and unrighteousness of men Romans 1 18 all people in their natural state are children under wrath you remember I told you some time ago that the right hand of God is what it's what mercy grace the left hand of God is what judgment so who is that apply to it applies to all of us that are in Jesus Christ if we stay under the blood covenant we are protected amen amen we walk out from under the blood covenant what happens we come under judgment the wrath of God always remember that right hand fellowship hallelujah fellowship with jesus Amen. left hand judgment don't go there because when you walk out from under christ the blood you walk into judgment the blood covers all our sins when god the father looks down upon any of us and he sees not your sin but he sees you as under the blood of Jesus Christ he sees Christ Jesus in you the hope of glory you're protected hallelujah Amen. shout it a little bit let the people know listen when they hear me they're gonna be hearing y'all over the internet too so it makes a little noise <laughs> Glory be to God. Amen. Paul says in Romans 1 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In Ephesians 2 3, he says, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, where by the nature the children of wrath even as others occasionally on the news however a reporter describes floods devastation uh fires like the heaven out in california and all over the place as uh biblical proportion 
Sometimes you hear the phrase uh, plague of biblical uh, proportion with reference to some like cataclysmic uh, swarm of bees right. killing everybody right. or a plague breaking out, killing everybody. And they say, well, it's uh, biblical proportion. To describe recent disasters in such extreme language makes me curious to how these reporters will describe the plagues of God when he pours them out on this world. Mercy. God sent the original plagues of the biblical proportion as Pharaoh and Egyptians, the 10 plagues recounted in Exodus chapter seven through 12, brought about the release of Israel from bondage. The beginning in Revelation eight, John foresees a series of divine plagues that we are ultimately in uh, ultimate in biblical proportion. He sees them as a parallel to the plagues of Egypt. But worldwide, both sets of plagues are warnings of offering the ungodly an opportunity to repent. God is allowing people to come to him. He has not shut them off totally. What does the Bible say? That he wished that all men would be saved. That's right. But they do what? They turn away from it. So you see the plagues that would sit there. There's a divine judgment that goes beyond and any natural explanation. Both sets results in salvation and victory for the people of God. Revelation chapter 8. Here's where we're going to be spending right much time, but we've got a lot of scriptures to cover. I hope I get through them today. But y'all be praying for me that the Lord give me everything I need to say. Because I tell you, it's a lot. And only so much time. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, John writes, he says, When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. This is what is called a dramatic pause. Considering the uh, catastrophe, uh, catastrophic uh, events in chapters 4 through 7, the sudden and deafening silence in heaven is startling. Now I want to kind of give you a little uh, overview of it. In heaven, before the silence took place, there was noise everywhere. Praising him. Praising him. But we're going to look at this for a moment. So look in uh, Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. It says, And this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. The impact of such silence must have been impressive for uh, until now everything has been done, has been done very loudly. Why was there silence in heaven for approximately 30 minutes? Why? The silence intensifies a sense of anticipation and awe for God's awesome judgment to follow. It is the calm before the storm of judgment to come as a few moments of calm precedes the most devastating destruction of a tsunami or a tornado or a hurricane. Think about it. Have you ever been in a in a hurricane caught right in the eye of it? It's calm. It is very, very calm. Yep. I've, I've been there. Yep. Everything is quiet. No wind blowing, nothing. Stillness. But Lord, look out when it does move. Amen. Because it breaks havoc everywhere. Yep. Tearing and ripping everything apart.
When we look in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20, Habakkuk says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Amen. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Then in Habakkuk 3, 3, he says, God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Uh, his glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. What are you going to be doing when you get to heaven? Praise. You're going to be praising him morning, noon, and night. Of course, there won't be any morning, noon, and night because time will have no meaning to us. It's going to be the perfect thing. You're going to be the perfect being that God intended you to be when he created all of us. Zechariah chapter 2, 13 says, Be silent, all, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Let me ask you a painful question. How many times when you, uh, when you were a kid, remember being spanked? Huh. Yep. If your parents was an effective disciplinarian in there, he or she made you wait for it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. And they replied, now, you, I'll be there with you in a few minutes, but those few minutes stretches out to about a half an hour or longer. Seriously, <laughs> which was worse, the emotional anguish or waiting for the physical pain of discipline? Uh, yeah. <laughs> None of us like that. In a similar way, God unleashes his power with an expression of silence and delay to ensure that he has full has our full attention of everyone in the universe. Revelation chapter 2, I mean 8, 2, John writes, he says, And I saw the angel, seventh angel, who stand before God, seven trumpets were given to them. These seven angels are those who stand before God. They are always prepared. Listen to what I'm saying to you this morning. They are always prepared. They are always available. They are always obedient to carry out God's will. In the same way, we are called to always and immediately obey God's decrees. Jesus exhorted his uh, disciples to pray in Matthew 6.10. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In what area of your life is the question that we put forth? Is the Lord urging you to be obedient to him? Are you willing to stand at an attention and say, Lord, whatever you ask, will you yield that area of your life that you've been holding back from him? John tells us that apparently God gives these angels seven trumpets of judgment by which they will execute his will. Trumpets play a major role in God's dealing with his people. They assemble the Israelites for war, for journeys, and for special feasts. Look with me in Numbers 9, 10, 9 and 10. And if ye go to war in your land against the enemy that oppress you, then ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpet, and you shall be, rem be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. Also in the day of your gladness, and in the solemn day, and in the beginning of your month, ye shall blow with the trumpet over your burnt offerings, and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. A trumpet was sounded at Mount Sinai when the law was given. Another was sounded at Jericho when the walls fell down. Another when a king was anointed. They, they, they announced the coming disaster. Here they announced divine judgment in the day of the Lord. In Joel chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, 
and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. In Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 through 6, God has something else to show us in this chapter. Question we put forth, what is our place in all of this? Do we have any role to play? Do we make happen anything? Another angel came and stood at the door in 8.3. The vision at this point is the very remnants of priestly service as it took place in Israel, tabernacle and temples. The Old Testament priests burned incense on the altar of incense that was symbolic of worship and prayers and of the people rising, uh, the prayers of the people rising to God. The angel is holding golden incense uh, censers. A censer is a bowl or fire pan designed for holding live coals and incense. The adjective golden is described the value of these senses. The angel is standing before God holding this very precious gift. It is then given much incense. What is incense? Incense is a precious and valuable perfume. It is esteemed. The next it, the text doesn't explicitly say who gives this angel the incense. Yet in Revelation, the Father is the one who gives or grants all things. Why was the angel given all of this incense? Verse 3 states, so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the, uh, the golden altar, which was before the throne. God desires incense to be added to the prayers of all the saints. If incense is added to the prayer, the, the incense will be diluted or worse yet contaminated. There are so many prayers that are prayed with selfish or impure motives. These are not precious or beautiful. This verse seems to suggest that even these Less noble prayers are precious to God. Hear what I'm saying to you this morning. Don't ever think your prayers are not precious to God. Because they are. Never give up on praying. Always stand firm on prayer. Remember Daniel prayed for 21 days to get his prayer answered had daniel given up he would not receive many times we pray and we pray and we pray and so what god is not going to answer i don't need to continue to pray well you just lost your blessing that's right you pray until you get the answer i don't want to sound repetitious god says pray if it means praying your prayer a thousand times, you pray that prayer a thousand times until you get the answer. Don't give up. Because when you give up, you just open the door for the devil to have a heyday in your life. Daniel didn't give up. He prayed continuously until his answer came. And you can read that account and find out all the, the good news behind it. I'm not going to tell you about it, no more than what I've said. You see, you may say, well, uh, I'm not such a saint. But you see, the Bible says that the, the past saints and the present saints, their prayers, not merely the super spiritual, but every saint. Everyone is a saint. Amen? Amen. Amen? By the way, a saint is any and every believer in Jesus Christ. That's who a saint is. Well, you may say, well, I'm no more, I'm more of a sinner than I am a saint. <laughs> well, I want to welcome to the club. Amen. <laughs> Because none of us are perfect yet. Amen? Amen. 
And of course, that may be true for uh, positionally speaking, but because of the work of the Son, the Father sees you as perfect. Hallelujah. You see, these verses teach us that there is something pleasing and fragrant about the prayers of the saints that God enjoys. Look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vows uh, full of odor, which are the prayers of the saints. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and 16, Now thanks be unto God, which always caused us to triumph in Jesus Christ, and maketh manifest the Savior, Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God, verse 15, look at what he says, For we are unto God a what? A sweet savor of Christ. And in them are saved, and in them that perish. Sweet savor. To the one, we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other, the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things our prayers are especially meaningful and fruitful when our lives match up our prayers i'm going to repeat that our prayers are especially meaningful and fruitful when our lives match our prayers don't ever forget it john goes on to tell us that the prayers of all the saints are on the golden altar which was before the throne. What a powerful picture. God esteems and enjoys our prayers so much that he keeps them before him. John describes further God's great pleasure with our prayers. Look in John, uh, Revelation 8, 4. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Psalm 141, 2 says, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as an incense, excuse me, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. How many of you got hands? Lift them up to the Lord. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> your evening sacrifice. This is afternoon right now, but that's your sacrifice. Lift them up to Praise God. The Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> In Revelation 8, 5, it says, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. There seems to be a connection between these prayers that go up before the judgment that comes down. Verse 5 says that the same censer that carried the prayers up to God is dipped down into the fire of the altar and flung toward the earth. The saints were martyred. Prayed that God would revenge, uh, avenge them. Their prayers are about to be answered. The storm is about to begin. There is a noise and a thunder and lightning and earthquakes. The seventh angel prepares to blow their trumpets. Mm. Here a few days ago, a few weeks ago, I was sitting at the computer and, uh, and there was a thunderstorm that was coming up and a bolt of lightning struck within mm. several hundred feet of the house. Well, I'll tell you, I don't usually jump, but I jumped that day. Uh. <laughs> Amen. Because I, it caught me unexpected. So I think about when Christ comes, He's going. It's going to catch a lot of people unexpectedly. Amen. I'll never forget one day we were driving cows up to the barn. I was out in the field. An electrical storm came up. And I was out in the middle of that field. You know, it's the worst place in the world to be in electrical storm. Amen. But I was out there, and I heard this pop of thunder and a ball of fire. That big came down and split an oak tree right from the top to the ground. I left the cows in the field. <laughs> Scared the daylights out of me if I had it in me. 
I got to the barn and everybody, where are the cows? They are out yonder. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there was not a fence too tall for me. I could still the barn. <laughs> but I got got out of that field real quick. I want about to see, wait around and see what was coming next. Amen. <laughs> but look at what Jesus says in Luke 49, 12, 49. He says, I am come to send fire on the earth. What will I, if it be already kindled? Both of these contexts are referring to God's judgments. Thunder, lightning, earthquakes. I'll never forget the earthquake we had not too long ago. Right. Yeah. This guy, a Mexican, he was in the garage with us. And I could, I, I, I didn't know at first, but, but the rumbling and the roaring that sounded, and everything began to vibrate. He said, what is that? And I said, we go, we're having an earthquake. <laughs> and we, we stood, and it didn't last long, but it seemed like a long time while it was doing that, and everything was shaking around us. Let me tell you something. What I've gathered here recently, if the, these massive earthquakes that are out in the Midwest and up here in the northern parts of the state should erupt. Yeah, problems. America's gone. There's nothing left. Do some research on it and find out. They have not erupted for a long, long time, but if they should break loose, all the plates in the earth are going to shift. The waters. You're going to see some of this stuff what it's talking about in Revelation here. Hmm. And Haggai 2.6 tells us this, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. This storm apparently implies the awful calamities that will come in the trumpet and bold judgments that are ahead. The census thus became a symbolic instrument of judgment to response to prayer. Verse 6 uh, informs us the seventh angel who had the seven trumpet prepared themselves to sound them. Once again, God's judgment was about to fall. It is worth noting that all the trumpet judgment proceed out of the seventh seal judgment. The seven seal, uh, the seven trumpet judgments are not the same as the seven seals. Both the bowl judgment and the trumpet judgment are within the seal judgment. These judgments are the one series in three movements. In other words, when the Lamb broke the seal, seventh seal, John saw not just one judgment, but a whole new series of judgments. Therefore, they are more severe than the first six seal judgments. This object is to lead hostile unbelievers to repentance. But few will repent. Look at Revelation 9, 20 and 21. The Bible tells us that as John writes, he says, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murderers, nor of their sorcerers, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. The remainder of chapter 8 gives us four the first four trumpet judgments. The first four trumpets uh, judgment falls on creation and the last three on mankind. Those last three I did not include in this sermon today. I don't know where the Lord's going with that one. We're going to have to wait and see. 
In 8-7 it says, The first sounded, and there came hail and fire and mixed with blood. And they were thrown to the earth, and a third part of the earth was burned up. A third part of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The uh, scene shifts again, this time from heaven, uh, from heaven to earth. The first trumpet blast signals the beginning of a judgment that involved hell, fire, and blood. Now, I don't know any, how many of you have ever seen a block of ice fall out of the sky, but I did witness it back many, many years ago. I mean, that thing was huge that came down. And I thought about when, when you get to researching and you're looking in the scriptures, when God sent the, the hail on Egypt, some of those, that block of ice could weigh up to 150 pounds. Think about what it can do to a building or anything there. And you got a whole bunch of that stuff falling at one time. Devastation everywhere. Look at Joel 2:30 and 31. And I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth and blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon shall uh, into blue, uh, blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Hail is only mentioned here in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, hailstones are a common element of God's judgment. But why were these judgments mixed with blood? Blood is a key word here. Blood is the uh, symbol of vengeance. Blood and fire were often combined as symbols of judgment. See, when God passed judgment on his son, what happened? He shed his blood. He shed his blood on Calvary's tree mm -hmm. to wash away all our sins. You see, this is similar uh, but let me look at uh, before I leave this uh, Ezekiel 38:22. He says, "I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain with great hailstones, fire and brimstone." We all know that brimstone is purification. It cleanses. Fire cleanses. It purifies. When we used to, years ago, we used uh, sulfur, which is basically it. When you read the book of, uh, when it talks about what he did to Solomon Gomorrah, sulfur, when you like that stuff, man, you don't want to be around it. Amen. <laughs> but we had to use it some of the bugs getting in the house, and you didn't have exterminators to come around and spray where we lived. <laughs> you did the next best thing. That's right. You use what you had, but you vacated the house. Mm -hmm. And then after it was over with, then you opened up all windows and doors and everything else. And and if you had electricity back then, we didn't have any electricity. So so we had to open up everything, mm -hmm. hoping the wind would blow it all out. But now you're telling on my age. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that ain't been too many years ago. All right. I don't know if I'm gonna make it through this or not. No, I'll stop it. In Exodus chapter 9, 18, it says, Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as has not been on in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even unto now. This judgment and revelation resulted in the fiery destruction of one third of the earth. Zechariah 13, 8 and 9, and it can, uh, shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts of therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein, and I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined, and I and will try them as gold is tried, and they shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say it is my people, and they shall say the Lord is my God. This would also refer to the various crops of the earth, like wheat, barley, rice, corn, etc. Besides the obvious ramification of losing a third of all lumber producing trees and will affect everything from home prices 
to availability of paper, the first judgment will also possibly have a significant impact on our most basic need, oxygen, which is by a byproduct of trees and vegetation. Uh, can you imagine how the destruction of, of a third of all the trees in the world and the destruction of grass will result in the balance of nature and the supply of food and oxygen? Most of us have seen the results of terrible forest fires when they uh, when even the ground was charred black and all the vegetation was destroyed, yet none has seen anything like this image. Even the ravaging uh, of large forest fires in Western United States is partial. We are supposed to picture one third of all of the earth. I'm gonna tell you, it's gonna be horrible. It's gonna be devastating. And, and, and because there's going to be death resulting in blood poured into the sea, the sea becoming blood and could be simply mean or referred to a tremendous loss of life. The impact of this enormous object will generate global tsunamis, tidal waves, floods, and unprecedented destruction. The first plague in Egypt in Exodus chapters seven, uh, 17 and 18 made the water undrinkable. Killed all the fish, had a terrible stench. And in this verse, uh, a third of the living sea creatures died. These creatures constitute the lowest and the most basic component of the world's uh, food chain. Their destruction will produce a significant domino effect on many higher forms of life. We know this is only a, a precursor to the second bold judgment found in Revelation. 16, three, three, three through six, that will result in the death of every living thing in the sea. Can you imagine that? Every creature that's in the sea, gone. Zephaniah chapter one, verse three, he says, I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heavens and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked, and I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. The third angel sounded, uh, sounded Revelation 8, 10, and 11, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is called Wormwood, worm, wormwood and a third of the waters became wormwood, and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. Next, a fallen star or a meteorite fell from heaven on the fresh water source of earth. It too was on fire. The name of this star was wormwood, or which means bitter. It was bitter herb that was a symbol of the divine punishment. And in uh, Jeremiah, Lamentation, wormwood is also the name of the demon that C.S. Lewis uh, uh, book screw tape letters. This star kills many men and causes a third of the flesh, fresh waters of the world to be bitter. The, this judgment recalls the bitter and water that God gives or gave the rebellious Israelites to drink in the wilderness, which the tree, when the tree was cast in, turned the water sweet. This is a reversal of the miracle of um, Mera recorded in Exodus 15, 25, where God made bitter water sweet for the people of Israel as they travel through the desert. A very important principle from this passage is sin brings bitterness. Amen. We must also remember that God has the power to make <laughs> sweet waters bitter and bitter waters sweet. The Bible says in Genesis 1 that man has been given dominion over the earth. But we must recognize that the long-term solution is not uh, passing more laws. It is repeating or repenting of our sin and turning to our creator. The greater threat is our environment is not carbon monoxide or chemical plants or nuclear reactors. The greatest threat is our environment is sin. You catch that? Sin. While committed Christians should be very conscientious 
in the way we care for the environment, creation will not be truly liberated and restored to its original state until mankind is right with God. In Revelation 8, 12, the fourth angel sounded, Sound it, and a third of the sun and a third of the moon and a third of the stars were struck and so that a third of them would be darkened and the day would not shine for a third of it and the night in the same way. The contrast of the first three trumpets, judgment against the land, the sea, rivers, and fountains of water. The fourth trumpet is aimed against the heavens. It is interesting that it was on the fourth day that God created and made visible to the earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars. This time the trumpet blast announced judgment on a third of the heavenly bodies. Darkness is common, uh, uh, common symbol of judgment of the Old Testament, and the day of the Lord was to be a time of darkness. Remember when Jesus was crucified, darkness fell on the earth. The sun was blotted out. The darkening of the heavenly bodies predicted in this verse also serves to warn of more judgments to come. Eventually, oh, evidently God will cut off the light from the sun, the moon, and the stars, and from the earth by one third. The, next, the text seems to imply that God will reduce the intensity of light from these sources by one third, perhaps partial eclipse or pollution in the atmosphere is is in view such a reduction in light and consequently temperature would have a devastating effect on the earth verse 12 describes an incredible atmospheric phenomenon which will result in the period of a continued uh, constitutes a day 24 hours being reduced by one third to 16 hours there is some similarity between this and the ninth plague upon Egypt, which brought supernatural darkness to the Egyptians for three days. Jesus promised that the sun and moon would be smitten, according to Luke 24, 29, and 30, and that the days would be shortened for the elect's sake. The impact of these phenomena is incalculable. World climates will suddenly change. Temperature will dramatically drop. There will be an unpredictable violent uh, atmospheric storm as well as interruptions of uh, botanical and biological growth of, uh, cycles since there existed in dependence of light for the photosynthesis. As a result, a significant portion of the world food supply will be destroyed. How long will it last? We, the question comes up. It seems to be temporarily since we are told Revelation 16 eight and nine, that this judgment will be reversed to a deadly extreme when the sun will be so intense that the earth and mankind will be scorched due to the intense heat. The final judgment, they rejected the true light. Now the light that has, that had is taken away. They rejected the water of life. No water is taken away. If the most dependable things in the world are taken away, the sun rising on top of the poison water and scorch the earth, what would be the impact of humans? I, can't, I can tell you this. Insurance companies would go bankrupt the very next day. There would not be enough money to replace any of that. Amazingly, there would be those who refuse to acknowledge increasingly, obviously, the fact that God is judging the earth and its inhabitants. But God's next messenger will be difficult to disregard. Think about it. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 13, he says, Then I looked and heard an angel flying in mid heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpets of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound the phrase then and i looked a signal a new scene in john's vision john next saw an angel flying through the sky and warning those living on earth to beware of the last three trumpets 
This could be literal. Listen to what I'm saying. This could be literal. An eagle. Oh, but an eagle don't talk. Who is God? <clears throat> Think about this. God has given animals the ability to communicate. He can use an angel because they are at his disposal. I'm not saying he's not. But an eagle, that, that would wake up some folks, wouldn't it? <laughs> Flying over the heavens above us, talking to us. Time is no more. Time is running out. You need to repent. You need to re see God. God goes the extra mile to bring in sinners. He doesn't cast them off like we would. And he begins to communicate to the people. You see, God used a donkey to speak to Balaam. I can still see that thing standing there talking to him. Lord have mercy. And he's talking back. Yeah, That's the Yeah. So this eagle, by the power of God, speaks to men. Eagles or vultures or birds of prey that approach rapidly and are a sign of disaster. According to Matthew 24, 28, thus the, this eagle is a fitting herald of God's judgment to come. Its loud voice further guarantees that everyone on earth will hear its message. How many of you have ever heard an eagle here in this vicinity? I've heard them many, many times over, and they are loud. They get your attention when they fly, and you know it's an eagle. Look, I, man, they're so graceful. Isn't that like God? He's so graceful. He's so understanding, so loving. And he's got his wings spread out. Call him. He said, come unto me. Amen. Come unto me, all of you that are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. I'm going to wind this up in just a few minutes. Because remember this, when I leave today, there are three more trumpets to be sounded. Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to get it all in, but it's too much to get in. Too much. You can, in two weeks. In two weeks. If the Lord leads me there. Because they're, they're still waiting. <laughs> all right. As we see this, the eagle, its loud voice, it guarantees that everyone on the earth will hear its message. The, uh, the eagle announces that the last three trumpets, judgments, which are also woes, they are especially had, uh, had, uh, uh, bad because they have a, a people rather than objects of nature as their targets. There are several examples of double woes in Scripture, but... Triple woes announce an even worse. Amen. The object of these judgments are earth dwellers, and their judgment is partially in response to the prayers of the tribulation martyrs. In Revelation 6.10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord God, holy and true, doest thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? A warning to those living on the earth to be aware of the last three trumpets, judgment, as severe as the first four trumpets have been. Worse is yet to come. The first four attack nature with mankind affected indirectly. The next judgments will attack humanity directly. John is saying the worst is yet to come. You haven't seen nothing yet. Amen. Amen. Lord, your word is true. It's enlightening. It's frightening. But it is joyful to know that the battle will be won and we have the victory Amen. because of what you have done. We haven't done anything, but you have done it all through us as we submit ourselves to you. We humbly pray and ask, Lord, to keep our hearts intact, 
to purify our minds, our hearts. Help us to understand that when we do mess up, that we continue to come back to you. Even though I, I know sometimes we don't feel like I'm not even worthy that they even bother to ask you for anything. But you've always been faithful and you've always been true. You have always forgiven when we sought your face. Thank you, Lord. I always remember what David prayed in Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, but restore unto me the joys of your salvation. And, re and renew a right right spirit within me help us Lord you have given us the opportunity to be the witness to the world because of what you're doing in our lives you're changing us from glory to glory day by day you're opening our understanding of your word far better than any of us ever realize because we see the day approaching the midnight hour is upon us and there's a lot of work to be done. I ask today that your blessings be upon your people, your blessings be upon those that heard this word, that they will not turn away from it, but they will embrace it, and they will call upon you in the name of Jesus, and you will save their souls and keep them in your kingdom. Amen. Help us, Lord, to grow in you. Help us to remember that you are always there. You never forsake. You never turn away. You never leave us but you're there to guide us all the way through until the very end. And when we are going to praise you like we have never praised you before. And now we thank you and praise you for this time in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. The Solid Rock, 223. <laughs> That's the third time. What's the third time? We sang it, we sang it before Sunday school. Oh, did you? And before, before. But well, it's confirmation. Yeah, we we might know it by now. Huh? Oh, crisis. <laughs> My oh, hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. In my trust, the sweetest spring, the holy lean of Jesus' name. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fills his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, His covenant, and His blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Rest in his righteousness alone, all blessed to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Yes, Lord, we stand on you and your promises. Today, Lord, I just ask that you seal the word in the hearts of everyone that heard it. That they leave this place being refreshed in you and knowing that today is soon approaching 
that we're all going to be together shouting for glory and honor and giving you praise, glory, and honor for everything you have ever done for us. But Lord, let us never forget that what you did at Calvary, because there you paid the ultimate price to bring us to where we are today. And now may the peace and grace of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost about upon each and every one and all of God's children said. Amen. Amen. God bless you and have a blessed week. Bless God bless you. Ray, I want to say something. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir